Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is session number 40. We're studying sanctification. We're in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. In verse 3 we were told that there was something the law could not do. And we're going to look at the second phrase in that verse. It says, what, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Now I know we're only looking at part of the picture of this verse so far. But the law could not produce functional life because it is weak through the flesh. It's depending on the flesh as its power source. We already knew that from chapter 7. We talked about that. Now let's look at the next thing in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, I don't think there's anybody that will have any problem understanding that Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection provided for our redemption from the penalty of sin. Penalty being the lake of fire. But along with that, we need to understand that in his death, burial, and resurrection, he also provided something for our sanctification. And in doing that, he condemned sin in the flesh. I want to take you back mentally just for a moment. Remember when we talked about when Jesus was buried for three days and three nights in the tomb and sin had no power to corrupt the body of Jesus whatsoever. He totally condemned sin in the flesh. That means he put sin to death with regard to your sanctified life. That's what condemned sin in the flesh is about. He provided for the sin that dwells in our members to be able to be put to death to keep, to, to enable us to live the sanctified life that he made possible for us. Now, again, that's all information that was taught to us back in Romans chapter 6. Remember, we talked about verses 3 and 4 being those verses. Well, when you talk about 5 and 6 and 7, it says, for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, and here's what it's referring to, our old man is crucified with him. You remember what we talked about, the old man, that's the old relationship that we had, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that because when, we, when it was our master and we were our slave, we had a body of sin, not anymore that henceforth we should not serve sin. That's what sets us free. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. He finished it, there's no more to do. Death hath no more dominion over him. And death never will have dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And the very thing that people think, that the law can do is the thing that it cannot do. And you, the thing that they think the law can do, which all this corrected, is what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. It did what people think the law is going to do. But as you recall, verse 3 was not the whole sentence. We need to attach to that now verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, verse 4 begins with that word that, which is going to give us the purpose statement. We understand that God sent His Son to condemn sin in the, in the flesh for the purpose of having the righteousness of the law being fulfilled in us. I want to talk to you about that righteousness. Earlier I asked a question and Linda said, she gave the answer as being righteousness. I said, oh, that's a really good answer. Because I had in my mind, there is a righteousness. When we talk about this, there is a righteousness that is imputed to us when we get saved in our justification. That's that perfect righteousness that we got when we got saved. But when we're talking about our sanctification... There is a righteousness now that we are able to live by. And it's not because we're going to obey the law, but it's because we're going to, we're going to take what the Spirit did and walk after that 
And we're going to be able to produce that righteousness in our daily lives, something that God is very interested in, something that God wants. Now, when you walk consistent with who he made you to be, sin gets condemned in your flesh. And I guess we should have backed up and talked about that a little more. Sin gets condemned in your flesh. In other words, you know you have sin dwelling in your members. This body didn't get redeemed, and sin didn't get exterminated. So what is this deal with sin? So what the Lord did was he condemned sin in the flesh that allows us now to actually put that sin to death on a, well, I want to say a day-by-day -day basis, but really it's more than that. It's in a moment-by-moment -moment basis that we are able to do that. Now, it's not something that you'll be made to do, but it is something that is available to be done. And, and that righteousness that we produce as a result of that is something that really pleases God. Now, verse 4, I pointed out to you that this verse does not say that the law might be fulfilled in us. Because again, it's not about the law. It's about the, the law, you, you know that when God gave the law back here, he was giving his perfect standard of righteousness. The law did represent that. That was his perfect standard of righteousness. When we live according to who the Spirit has made us to be in Jesus Christ, we now produce the righteousness Con that of the law. We, and not, the, not the law, but the righteousness of the law. And that's what God was after all along. If a guy could have perfectly kept the law, he wouldn't have needed anything else. But he can't. But that righteousness now can be produced in us under grace if we walk after the Spirit. If we put our position in Christ and to practice properly, sin will not have dominion over us, just like uh, Romans 6, 14 said. And we won't be giving sin any power. It's not going to be able to outperform us in any way. Now, by this time, if the things that we've been talking about here have been properly understood, you understand then that walking after the Spirit is the only successful way you're ever going to put your sanctified life into practice. There is no way you'll be able to do that under the law. Now, there's some things that we're going to look at here. In fact, let me just pass this out to you. Let me just do this here. Okay, Linda, you can help me out. That would be great. This is a note taker, and we normally pass these out at the start, but I'm passing them out now because we're passing them out now because I want to I want to make sure that you can articulate these things. There's ten questions on these four verses, and I want to make sure that we're able to say them. I want to make sure that you're able to say, "I know what this is. I can identify this," and so. We're going to go through this note taker here. So, let's put it up on the PowerPoint, and that is in Romans in Romans 8:1, the condemnation refers to what? The condemnation, the death of your functional life. And there's I've, I've had the answer up with the question on the PowerPoint, so I couldn't give you the question first. The death of our functional life, not our eternal life. Question number two has a phrase attached to it here. And that is, <laughs> I did this with every one of them. I don't know why I did it like that. That was just really stupid. All right, number two. What does it mean to walk after the Spirit? Somebody want to say something? What does it mean to walk after the Spirit? Okay, to be under grace and not do it under the law, that's true. Something, something else? Here it is. To conduct ourselves, and it is under grace. It's the only way you do it under grace. To conduct ourselves in concert with who we have been made to be in Jesus Christ. Walking is conduct. 
Walking after the Spirit is walking, is conducting yourself after who the Spirit made you to be. Now, I didn't put Spirit in the answer, but I think you understand that. It's the Spirit that baptized you into His death, burial, and resurrection. That's what walk after the Spirit is. It, uh, it is follow after that thing which the Spirit provided. And what did he provide? Baptism into his death, burial, and resurrection. Setting you free from the old relationship. Destroying the body of sin. Making you free from the law of sin and death. Sin shall not have dominion over you. All that kind of business. Alright? Question number three. What is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Here's the answer. Now this is a, I know it's a long answer. The unfailing truth of that which was performed by the spirit in connection with our functional life in Christ, you could just have that. I.e., for example, that every time I conduct myself in accordance with who I've been made to be in Christ, I'm free from the law and incur no functional death. So you could just have the first part of that. I mean, the, first part, the last part's just an example. The unfailing truth of that which was performed by the Spirit in connection with our functional life in Christ. There's a better way to say that, I, I know. So let's do that. What's a, better, what's a better way to say that? I'm all for short... Okay, 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 okay. She said, don't talk. The law of the Spirit... Of, you, you know what? You know what? We kind of said it. Okay, look, I'm not trying to undo what you're doing. Shall I wait? That really is the long way of saying what happens when you walk after the Spirit. Right? It is the detailed explanation of the previous verse. The previous verse says, Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So here's the details. Well, it did get detailed, didn't it? At least I was true to the detail. But it is, it, it is the unfailing truth of walking after the Spirit. It's the law. That that works every time. You could, we could say it like that. All right, number four. What is the law of sin and death? There you go. I'm sorry. It's the Mosaic Law. And of course, because I'm always so brief, and its unfailing ability to bring about functional death for anyone seeking to use it to produce their own sanctification. And it is a law. It unfailingly does that. It will kill your sanctified life. Okay? Number five, what is it that the law could not do, according to Romans 8, 3? All right, condemn sin in the flesh. Exactly right. The law could not condemn sin in the flesh. Number six, why couldn't the law do that? <laughs> Patricia's got all the answers from here on now. She's got it. Number six is, because it's dependent upon the flesh to empower it. The flesh is too weak. The law has no power of its own. All it does is demand. It looks to the flesh. And boy, when it does that, trouble. Because the flesh is inherently weak. It cannot. Everybody ready? All right. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 3, what did Jesus do that enables us to successfully put into practice our sanctification? <laughs> he did. He condemned sin in the flesh. He came. I, I just include that first part. You already know about that. He came, put on flesh, and dwelt among. I mean, you knew that. He came in the light of sinful flesh, and he successfully condemned sin in the flesh. He did. Now, here's the big one. What does condemned in the flesh mean? 
condemned sin in the flesh mean? What does that mean? All right. It means that sin, that's the sin that's in your flesh, has been put to death. I like annihilated. I like that one. Condemned with regard to your sanctified life so that sin cannot operate in you or have dominion over you. That's Romans 8, 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. So that means that sin has been put to death with regard to your sanctified life. That would be the short version of that. Sin has been put to death with regard to your sanctified life. Now that, that only means that that opportunity exists. That's not an automatic. A person can choose not to live according to who they have been made to be. And in that case, sin is very much alive. So it's just a pit. Are you going to live like who you've been made? And that's why it was important for us to understand who we've been made to be. So when you understand that, that becomes a reality, you can live out of that. And that's grace living. Okay. Everybody, everybody ready to move on? All right, number nine. What was Jesus' purpose in condemning sin in the flesh? Why did he do that? That's right. So that the righteousness of the law be fulfilled in us. That we can live righteously in our daily lives. I just defined it after that little slash is all that is. He made it so we can actually live righteously even though we're living in a body with sin dwelling in its members. We have the ability to still live righteously. And that's not because of the law, but that is because he condemned sin in the flesh. And when we live after who the Spirit has made us to be, that sin is condemned in our flesh. It is put to death. Has no power over us whatsoever. And we talked about that back in Romans 6. The only power sin has now that you've trusted Jesus as your all-sufficient Savior is the power you give it. And it's just counting on the fact of you falling into the old ways. Number 10, what is the righteousness of the law? And I may not have talked to you enough about this, so let me just put it up here for you. The righteousness of the law is equal to the very righteousness of God himself. Remember, it is his perfect standard of righteousness. The righteousness that is produced in us through the sanctification provided for by grace through Jesus Christ. That last part is just an explanation of the first part, which is the answer. So the righteousness of the law is that which is equal to the very righteousness of God himself. That can get produced in us when we walk after the Spirit. Okay, did anybody miss anything as you were writing things down? I need to back up to it. Yes, for I am holy. Right, right. A command that he wanted Israel to have, they could not produce that. Because they tried to do it under the law. Now we are given the ability to actually produce that fruit unto holiness. Okay, let me give you, as an end of this session, let me give you a flyby over verses 5 to 13. To just kind of give you a lay of the land here. Because the question that you probably have in your mind by the time you get to verse 4 is, you say, okay, there's no condemnation to me if I walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, I get that. And then you, you go back to, to verse 2 and you get the details of that. And you say, okay, I know I'm not going to have condemnation in my functional life. I understand what walking after the Spirit is. It is, me, it is, it is that law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that works every time that I put it into practice. It works. I get that. But the question in your mind by the time you get to the end of verse 4 has to be this. 
So exactly how do I do that? I understand now that it's a law, and I understand that it works every time, and I understand it's not after the flesh, but it's after the spirit. I understand that uh, the dichotomy here. It's not flesh, it's after the spirit. It's not about the law of Moses, but it's about what the spirit has made me to be in Jesus Christ. I get that. What these verses are going to do now is answer the question, how is that done? And I'm going to give you the answer without just, I'm just going to give you the answer, but then we'll look at it in the scripture. That gets done by teaching you to think in a particular way. That's where it all is going to go. That is going to determine the steps that you take, what you say, where you go, how you respond to situations, how you respond to circumstances that come up. That's the issue. It's going to be about changing the way you think. Because I'm going to show you this. He is going to talk about minding, and he's going to fill that in. Minding the things of the flesh and minding the things of the spirit. And when he's talking about minding, he's talking about a way of thinking. Putting your mind to it. And by the way, it's, it's, it, this is not as general as you might think it is. Like minding the things of the flesh and minding the things of the spirit. He's going to define those things for you. Just like we went through that list and said, what does it mean when he says he condemns sin in the flesh, what does walk after the Spirit mean? What, what does God understand that to mean? Well, he understands this to be something too. So in these next verses, what he's going to do is he is going to give you an understanding of here's how I'm supposed, the way I'm going to do it, the way I'm going to, the way I'm going to put my position into practice is to change the way I'm thinking about some things. And when you begin to do that, that's, the skill that you need to now be able to put your position to Christ into practice when, when temptation and sin raises up, that's what you'll be able to do. And by the way, that's what walking in the Spirit, uh, I'm sorry, walking after the Spirit is all about. And these verses are going to go, go, go through to make sure that you understand that and that you're confident in it so that you will, at the end of these verses, you will know Every time, you won't ever guess and go, am I doing this right? Am I really living righteous? Is this, is this really right? Is this happening? You won't have those questions. Because thinking about it the way God wants you to think about it will convince you so that you will absolutely know. Because, that's the last thing I'll say to you is, walking after the Spirit is achieved by minding the things of the spirit and not minding the things of the flesh. The only thing we haven't done is we haven't defined those terms. But that's exactly what he's about to do. This is the how. This is the how this gets done. And that's what's contained in verses 5 through 13. So when we come back in the next time, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take it up in verse 5 and we're going to follow this through because these 13 verses are... The end of this particular area about being dead unto sin and alive unto God and how to live that sanctified life every day. Because as soon as the verse 13 nails that down, then you're given the third aspect of your sanctification and that's your adoption as sons and daughters. And then we, and then that, and then we go into that. Yeah, hallelujah, okay. So, let me ask you, when you, the notes are in the back, if you haven't already picked them up for today, go over those notes to make sure that you don't have anything in your mind about these first four verses that you say, you know, I'm still not clear about that. I'm still not sure about that. Because if you're not, if that's not, if I haven't said it right, I need to say it so you'll get it. So that when we go on to this other part, you're not just left with a, you know, a hole in this part of, of what's been.